So Imad posted that bachelor in a video on YouTube, kind of response to what we believe. And of course, I understand that there's a lot of questions that, that may be coming his way. And um, he tries to answer one aspect of, of the truth that we hold, and that being the idea that Christ is God's only begotten son. He feels, obviously, that if he makes the, his point regarding Christ being begotten or created, then the matter should be laid to rest. But is it that obvious? Is it that simple? And is he correct in his assertion regarding Christ being begotten or not? So please, maybe just sum up what he says in the video, and then you can um, give us what the Bible teaches. And of course, we invite everyone to pick up um, their Bibles to follow with us. And also, please do watch the, uh, the videos online of the actual persons that we are um, looking at, all the pastors, because it has been said that sometimes we take things out of context. So for context's sake, please go and view the full video so that you can be sure that we are doing our best to stay true to the speaker's words and intentions and answering it honestly. So Imad, please go ahead and share with us what Pastor Doug had to say regarding this. Thank you, uh, Virgil, for, uh, for that introduction and for asking the question. Uh, yeah, look, it is it, it, true what you said, pretty much what Pastor Doug, what, one of his foundational uh, uh, points in, in, in this section, in this question that he addresses in a eight, nine minute video, is Jesus created? One of his points is, uh, uh, his argument is built on the assumption that the word begotten, if the word begotten is taken literally, that is to mean what it says, to mean that, uh, to mean born, if it is taken lit literally and applied to Jesus before the incarnation, then it must mean created. Now, some are going to parse and argue with the words. They say, well, Jesus was not made. He was begotten and he came out of the father. And they try to make a, an argument with semantics. But the fact is that if there was a time when Christ, Jesus did not exist, and then through some act of the Father, he was brought forth, he was created. That's all you can say. You can't you know, change the words and try to say, well, begotten is different than being created. If he's brought forth by the Father, if he goes from being non-being to being by an act of the Father, he's created. I believe that this is a wrong assumption that uh, Pastor Doug is building on. Begotten does not mean created. Now, Pastor Doug agrees with that. He understands begotten does not mean create. But again, he, he, he is saying, he's implying that if we take it to mean born and we apply it to Jesus before creation, then it means he is created. Now, this leaves me in order to, to, to address it. We have to address a few questions. Number one, was Jesus begotten before the incarnation? Is there any biblical evidence that Jesus was begotten before the incarnation, right? I think it, it behooves us to know what the Bible has to say about that. And the second question is, what does begotten mean? What does the Bible reveal that the word means? And is there a difference between being begotten and being born? I will address these three questions, hopefully as briefly as we can. The first one is, was Jesus begotten before the incarnation? Uh, uh, Pastor Doug says that God was only begotten in the incarnation i will show you the clip but that's what he says god was only begotten in the incarnation now we will refer to proverbs 8 later on but for now i want to share some verses that hopefully will make the the one who's listening and watching think the first one let me share the bible and it is taken from um first john chapter 4 First John chapter 4 and verse 9. I want you to pay attention to the words, how uh, uh, the author John words it. He says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because the God sent his only begotten son into 
the world that we might live through him. Now, if English mean anything, this verse has to mean that God had a begotten son and he sent his only begotten son into the world. world. That, that is what the verse is saying, right? Notice, God sent someone. Who did he send? John says, God sent his only begotten son into the world, right? So if I say, I sent my son, Daniel, I have my eldest son, his name is Daniel. I sent my son, Daniel, to war. What would you understand? You would understand that I had a son and I sent him to war. You wouldn't understand that Daniel became my son after I sent him to war. That, that, that doesn't make sense. Nobody interprets sentences and words that way, right? If I said, I sent my son to war, it means I had a son and then I sent him to war. So this verse, if that is the only verse that we have, according to John, God sent his only begotten son into the world. This verse tells us that God had a begotten son before he sent him into the world. That's what, the, that's what English uh, uh, means if we are to believe the Bible as it says. So that's the first verse. The other verse is from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Talking about Jesus, it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Notice how it reads in the Bible in basic English. And it says, uh, verse 15 again, here it is, who is the image of the unseen God coming into existence before all living things. The mm. CEV reads this way. It says, Christ is exactly like God who cannot be seen. He is the firstborn son superior to all creation, right? And there's another translation also uh, that says very similar uh, 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 to the Bible in basic English. Pretty much what it's saying is that God sent his son into the world and this verse tells us that Jesus is uh, 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 like the unseen God. He has the nature of God and he came into existence before all creation. That's what the King James says. He is uh, firstborn of every creature. He's the begotten son of God before all creation, right? Uh, that's another verse. Notice what Micah says. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, right? Now, allow me to share with you how different translations read it. I will put it in here because I don't have on my software these uh, translations. But the Good News Bible says, whose family line goes back to ancient times. The GW translation says, his origins go back to the distant past to days long ago the erv says his beginnings are from ancient times from long long ago the cev says someone whose family goes back to ancient times right so mm -hmm. this verse it's telling us about the one who will come from bethlehem but it says his family origin, his family line, his, his beginnings, his origin is from the days of eternity, right? So when, when, when you read that his family line or his origin, that means he did have an origin and it goes all the way back to the days of eternity, right? Another verse that's very famous, very well-known verse, and that is John 3.16. We all know it. It says, for God, here it is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. So who did God give? He gave his only begotten son. Did God have an only begotten son to give? Well, he most assuredly did. As a matter of fact, if you link this verse with Isaiah, where is Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. It's a prophecy about Jesus. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. For that child to be born in the human race, a son had to be given, right? And, and that's what John said in, in 1 John, for God, uh, uh, God sent his only begotten son into the world. That's what Isaiah is talking about. The two different things in here. And to us, the human race, a child was born, a savior was born. But in order for that savior to be born, a son had to be given. And that's what John uh, 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 writes, the words of Jesus in, in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son into the world. Right? Again, in uh, another one in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. It's talking about creation. It says, who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. So it's referring to creation, but it refers to uh, 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 the, the, the creator of the world or the creators of the world. And it refers to them as uh, uh, by relationship as father and son, right? So the reason I'm sharing these verses is simple. I'm trying to establish and prove the fact that the Bible is clear that Jesus was the son of God before he came into the world. If that is so, uh, sorry, if that is not so, then we might as well throw John 3.16 out of the Bible. Because John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And if Jesus was never begotten, then he was never really the son of God. So God did not really give his son. Why didn't Jesus say God gave himself? Why didn't he say God gave his friend? Why didn't he say God gave part of himself? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, and John said, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if God so loved the world that he gave his son, and John says that God sent his only begotten son into the world, I believe it is only logical, it's only scriptural for us to believe that God had a begotten son before he sent him into the world. Right? So it doesn't matter what theologians say. It doesn't matter what pastors say. It doesn't matter what traditions say. Let every man be a liar, but God, let God be true. If, if the Bible says that God sent his only begotten son into the world, then Jesus was the only begotten son before he came into the world, before the incarnation. This is reading the Bible and believing what it says. It's as simple as that. So this deals with the first point, was Jesus begotten? before the incarnation. Now, I, I know Proverbs 8 speaks strongly to that. I will come to that in maybe this video or another video, but I just wanted to show that there is other evidence other than Proverbs 8 in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that leads the reader of the Bible, the believer of the Bible, to believe that Jesus was the begotten son before the incarnation. Amen. But that's, that's my uh, first point. Now, the, the, the second question is, what does begotten mean? We saw clearly from the Bible, from the New Testament, that Jesus was the begotten son before the incarnation, okay? Well, what does begotten mean? Pastor Doug says, well, if you are to take it literally, then Jesus is created. That is not so. Other theologians will tell you, well, begotten means unique. Well, what does the Bible say? How are we to understand it? Pastor Doug, and I will show you the clip, uh, 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 says, Really, to say that Jesus was begotten or um, meaning born, begotten doesn't mean that. Begotten simply means that um, when Christ was incarnate, the only time God was begotten is in the incarnation in Jesus. 
And that was when God became a man. I'm not sure how the listener will understand Pastor Doug's words, but he said clearly, begotten does not mean born. And he said, it means when God uh, 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 was incarnated in Jesus, right? That's what he said it means. Well, that could be so according to Pastor Doug, but what does the Bible say? How does the Bible use the term begotten? So many times we get stuck in what this man said, what that man said, what this theologian said, and so forth. But if we only let the Bible interpret itself, all what you have to do is look up the word begotten, see how it's used, and then you can understand what it means. So let's let's pull out some of the verses that use the word begotten, and let's see what the Bible uses that word as it, it, before we start reading uh that word begotten is only used nine times or in nine different verses in in uh in the new testament right three out of those nine times it refers to people other than jesus here they are in luke chapter 7 and verse 12 notice what we read now when he, that is Jesus, came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son, that word only son, or only, is begotten, uh, is, is monogenes, which is translated as begotten, right? The only son of his mother, and she was a widow, okay? What does the word begotten here, or rather monogenes, which is the Greek word that's translated begotten, translated as the only son, and so forth, it's used in here. What does that word mean in here? Obviously, it has nothing to do with the incarnation. It has nothing to do with divinity becoming human. It simply means this dead man was the only born son of his mother. It's simple English, right? That's what the word monogenous in here means. In chapter 8 of Luke, in verse 42, this, the word monogenes, which is the Greek word for begotten, is used again. And here is how it reads. For he had only one daughter. That's Jarius' daughter, right? He had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. That word only, one only daughter oh, is uh, monogenes. Again, what does it mean in here? If you're an honest Bible student and you're reading it, what does it mean? It means she was, he had only one born daughter. There's no way, no two ways about it, right? In chapter 9 and verse 38, again, the word monogenes is used in here and read, and behold, a man of the company cried out saying, Master, I beseech you, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. He is my monogenous. Okay, what does the word mean in here? It means only born, right? So in all the instances, which there's only three, that this word monogenous is used or applied to someone else other than Jesus, it always and only means only born. Nothing mm -hmm. else. Nothing else, right? Um. All what you have to do, as a matter of fact, let, let, let's do it now. Um, I'll pull out the dictionary, Strong's Concordance, and notice, um, notice what it says in verse 38. Only child, here it is. That's according to the Strong Concordance, monogenous. It means only born, that is soul, only begotten child right mm -hmm. that's what the strong concordance tells you the word means that's how it is applied when we read it in the three times that do not ref apply to jesus right mm -hmm. okay now why is it that when this word is used to refer to jesus we suddenly apply a different meaning to it like pastor Doug said it does not mean bone other theologians will tell you it means unique. Why is that? Why don't we just let the Bible 
interpreted itself and accepted as it reads. Now, I'm familiar with, uh, in Hebrews, there is a verse that uses the word monogenes and applies it to Isaac. And it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten, right? And theologians would argue that Isaac was not the only child of Abraham. Rightly so. Abraham had more children. And they say, well, there you go. That means the word monogenes, which is translated begotten, does not mean only born. It means unique because Isaac was unique. Well, look, no doubt Jesus was unique. No doubt. But what we need to ask ourselves is, how many children did Abraham have from Sarah? He only had one. So uh, Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son from Sarah. And that's who the promise was made to, that Abraham will have a child from Sarah, right? So God's promise to Abraham was referring to Abraham's marriage with Sarah. And as far mm -hmm. as the promise is concerned, and as far as this relationship and this marriage is concerned, Isaac was Abraham's only begotten and only born son because Abraham only had one son from Sarah, right? So with that said, the word begotten, monogenes in the New Testament simply means only born, right? So with all due respect to Pastor Doug, he's doing a great work, but when he says begotten does not mean born, that is, that's that wrong. All what you have to do is do what we did. Look up the word, how it's used in the New Testament, and you can find out for yourself what the word means. Imad, before you go in, the examples that you've cited with um, reference to uh, Mono Guinness, um, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it doesn't matter, but the words, at least the verses you cite, it, it continuously have, has the words only. And the, they could have, or at least the writer could have maybe put in, for instance, his son or his daughter. But this idea of only when, when the Greek reader reads those passages, it is very clear that what the author wanted to convey is that it wasn't just a son, because you could then run away with saying, well, it was maybe his adopted son, or not um, really son, or just or a son. You know, we often use the word son loosely, where, for instance, you would see my son, um, we were out the other time together, and you would say to Mason, my son, come here. But the idea that the Greek author wants to convey is indeed that this was the only born child of the person being spoken of in the verses you cited. So, that, that's important because I think while people don't see the word born maybe there, they see only son, but everyone that you've cited has this idea of only child, um, whether it be a, a boy or a girl. And I believe strongly, like you correctly state, that the idea that wants to be conveyed, this is my only child, literally my, this is my son or my daughter. So that's, um, I think, yes, it, it really makes a lot of sense as you explain it. And another thing that I've picked up in Mad, and I see you have the version. Um, I, I think that's your your what your first language. On ESO, my first language, just so that you know, is Afrikaans. And um, when the Afrikaans translators translated that word "only begotten" uh, into my native language, it actually reads "only born." In Afrikaans, in my in language, I'm not sure what it reads in your language. So, so the translators weren't weren't confused regarding this, and I'm sometimes amazed at how pastors, who, who many of them aren't linguists, um, kind of override some of the people who've actually done work in this field when it comes to translating the Bible from the original to uh, other translations. So I don't know what it reads in your original, of course, in your uh, mother tongue, but in mine it reads "only born," literally. It is so you, you, you. The whole idea of what has begotten mean actually in my it's it's 
it's very simple because it actually it's if you know what born means then yeah, you yeah. know what my is saying so yeah yeah well uh, yeah obviously your, your 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 language puts it very clearly in in arabic if you translate it literally from arabic to english it uh, uh, it says only son his only son right okay, um, okay. like what it says to all these other examples that we read the dead man his oh, yes. only son and 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 so forth which is yeah granted but yeah thank you thank you for sharing that highlighting that uh, virgil all right so going back to 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 the point we've We've established that Jesus was begotten before the incarnation from the New Testament. We saw that the word begotten means born. It means only born. So now the question that we're left with is, is there a difference between born and created, right? Because Pastor Doug obviously does not believe begotten to mean created. He doesn't. But the way he's coming across in his video is he's saying, if you want to apply if you want to take begotten to literally means born and you want to apply to Jesus prior to the incarnation, then you, then you are saying that Jesus is created. It makes no difference. Begotten, born, created prior to the incarnation. If Jesus didn't exist and then he came into existence, it means he's created. Well, I beg to differ. The first thing is that the, the Bible uses two different words as Pastor Doug would know and any other person uh, who knows the Bible would know, it uses two different words for begotten and created, two different Greek words in the, in the New Testament and two different Hebrew words in the, in the Old Testament, right? So the question is why? If there is no difference in the meaning, then why use two different words? This alone tells us that there is a difference. To be begotten does not mean created. So when the Bible says that Jesus was begotten in the days of eternity, oh, prior to the incarnation, right? When the Bible says that Jesus was begotten prior to the incarnation in those verses that we saw and we will see later in Proverbs 8, that means the, author of, the authors of the scriptures, as inspired by God, they didn't want us to think that Jesus was created. They wanted us to believe that Jesus was born. That means there is a difference. So to simply... Uh, uh, Tarnish them all with the same brush like Pastor Doug did. Well, if he didn't exist and then he existed, doesn't matter what word you want to use, it means he's created. Well, that's too simplistic with all due respect. The, the Bible wants us to understand something. So it's using the term born to Jesus prior to the incarnation. Why? What message are we to get from it? Just like in the New Testament, when the writers refer to Jesus as the Messiah, they mean something. When they refer to Jesus as the second Adam, they mean something else. When they refer to Jesus as uh, 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 the Lamb of God, they mean something else. Words, titles, and so forth have meaning. So when they refer to Jesus as born or begotten, they mean something. And to throw that meaning away and say, well, it means created, you just missed the point, right? So what is the difference between born and created? As human beings, we understand what birth is. We understand that to be born of our parents means we are human like them. We inherit yes. their qualities. And unfortunately, in this fallen world, uh, world many times we inho inherit their weaknesses and, and character traits, right? Uh, sometimes you have a, a, a dad who's an alcoholic. You might have a son who doesn't want to drink alcohol, but there's always that weakness in the genes, right? Uh, and, and, and so forth. But to be born from someone, that's the point. To be born from someone, it means you possess their nature and qualities, right? To be created, on the other hand, is to come out of nothing. Only God can create. And, and, and we read about creation that he spake and it was. He created things out of nothing he created the seen out of those that are unseen we read in in hebrews 11 right now lucifer let me share the bible in here um, lucifer was created we read in ezekiel 28 and verse 15 about lucifer thou was perfect in thy ways from the days that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee now in here, talking about Lucifer, it says he was created. It uses a different 
Hebrew word than the Hebrew word that is used about Jesus in Proverbs 8 in, in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, right? But even the word created and begotten are different in the New Testament as well. Greek. We'll get to Proverbs 8 in another video. But in here, we read about Lucifer that he was created. Jesus, on the other hand, was begotten. We are never told that Jesus is created. Jesus is begotten. Why, why make a distinguish, the distinction? rather? Is there a difference between begotten or being created? Yes, of course, there is. Lucifer is not divine. Jesus is. Lucifer is a creature. Jesus is not a creature. He is the creator. Well, why is that? Lucifer was created. He came out of nothing. While Jesus was begotten, he came out of the father's substance, if you may. Hence, he has the father's nature and qualities. I want you to think of this. Every Jew could claim to be the son of God. And no problem. God said about Solomon, notice in 2 Samuel, here it is, chapter 7 and verse 14. God was talking about Solomon, uh, uh, David's son. He says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I'll chastise him and, and so forth, right? Obviously, uh, this had a second application about the Messiah in the New Testament. But literally, in the first application, it was spoken about Solomon. And God says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. So Solomon is the son of God. Nobody stoned him for claiming to be the son of God. In the New Testament, in John chapter 8, the Jews told Jesus, verse 41, Jesus told them, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. <clears throat> Why am I sharing these verses? Any Jew could claim to be the son of God. You could, as a Jew, you could say that God was your father and you won't get into any trouble. It, 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 it would not have been regarded as blasphemy to say that God was your father, to say that you are a son of God. No problem. Yet when Jesus claimed to be the son of God, it was different. They regarded it as blasphemy. They wanted to stone him. Why? Notice, here is the verse in John chapter 10 and verse 36. Jesus says, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemeth, because I said I am the son of God. Why is that? Why is it that when Jesus claimed to be the son of God, they wanted to kill him? As a matter of fact, notice just before it, how the Jews understood his claim to mean, right? In, in verse 33, just two verses earlier, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. What was his claim? His claim was, he said, I'm the son of God. <clears throat> the Jews understood it to mean you making yourself God. I don't want you to miss the link in here. His claim of sonship was understood by the Jews as claiming divinity, as claiming equality with God. Why is that? It is because they understood what he meant. They understood that he meant it literally. The point I want to bring across is this. The Jews at the days of Jesus understood what begotten means. And they understood Jesus' claim of sonship is not referring to him simply being born of Mary. They understood that whatever sonship Jesus was talking about, it made him divine. So, when the Bible refers to Jesus as begotten, there is a big difference than created. When the Bible tells us that Jesus was begotten and refers to him as begotten before the incarnation, it does not mean he was created. 
it means he was born of God. And as a result, he has the nature of God and the qualities of God. That's what the term begotten means. And that is the difference between begotten and created. So again, I said it before. I will say it again. To, to look at it simplistically and to say if Jesus didn't exist and then he came into existence, it doesn't matter what word you want to use, begotten, born. It simply means he's created. To do that is to miss what the Bible is saying. The authors of the Bible are telling us that Jesus was begotten or born of God before the incarnation. This means that Jesus has the nature of God, that Jesus has the God nature, that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is equal with the Father in divinity, in nature was. That means he's not a creature, he's a creator. That means he's worthy of our worship. Now, all this is based on his sonship. When Jesus taught the disciples his divinity, he never told them I'm divine. He never told them I'm God. He simply told them I'm the son of God. And they understood what he meant because his, son, his divinity and his godship, if you may, is based on his sonship. Uh, so there is a big difference between begotten and created. To understand the true meaning of begotten is to understand the divinity and the godship of Jesus. I will, I will leave it at that. Imagine you make it perfectly clear that indeed there is a difference. I understood from your earlier comments too that creation was a, an act that was done once at the beginning. But everything that was after su subsequently that, that came to existence was as a result of light begetting light, whether it be in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, in, the, in, in, in humanity. Um, no one is going to say when a child is born today, look at what God has just created because that child was born from the same substance. And so that principle is, is their nature. So in, very clearly creation and begotten do not mean the same things. Now, Imad, there's a verse that may cause confusion regarding the point that you make at the, at the end here. And it's in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And for our viewers, I'd like to maybe just clear that up. And I'm going to ask you to go there on your screen as we conclude this point. Uh, I just think that there might be someone out there who will be thinking, but what about this verse? So I want you, Imad, if you don't mind, to read this verse for us. And then I see you do have the Bible in basic English and the contemporary English version and the ISV. If you then can read them in those three versions afterward. So this is Revelation 3 and verse 14. The King James, if you read it, it gives you kind of not the real sense of what is actually being said there. So please go okay. ahead. And yeah, in Revelation 3, 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodicean write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And if you just simply read it from the King James Version, it seems to be saying that Jesus was the beginning of a creation of God. That means Jesus was the first thing that, or first person that God mm -hmm. created. Right, but I think this is a mistranslation. The, uh, the BBE puts it clear. It says, "And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, say these things: saith the true and certain witness, the head of God's new order." Right? Uh, he's the and head the of CEV as well. C CEV says, "This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Laodicea: I am the one called." A A Amen. I'm the faithful and true witness and the source of God's creation. Listen to what I say. The source of God's creation. So, yeah, yes. I get... Sorry, did you have you another can... version in mind? Well, yeah, you can read it. Uh, ISV as well. I ISV, yeah, I do have it. Actually, it's right here. And it says, uh, the originator of God's creation. Mm -hmm. Right? Um yeah, so there you go. That, that clears it. Jesus is not created. He is not a creature. He is a creator. God created everything through his son, the Bible says, over and over. 
and over again. He is the 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 chief of of creation, meaning the the originator of creation, the source of creation, and and, and the head of creation. But he is not a creature. Amen. All right. Thank you for clearing up that for us. Um, I think yeah, we've been thorough. Um, you have done your utmost best to to set what the Bible makes plain to set that uh, clear for us and clarifying the issues. And again, I, I really see Pastor Doug um, falling short really of good um, uh, uh, biblical exegesis, as it were, looking at all the evidence regarding the subject. So thank you, Mark, for clearing that for us. Mm -hmm.